That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Vengeance, the directorial debut of B.J. Novak, which premiered at the 2022 Tribeca Film Festival. Notably, it's a Blumhouse production that is being released courtesy of Focus Features, July 29th, 2022. What do we know B.J. from? The Office. Oh. Uh, there was a lot about this movie I liked, so overall I would say it's good. Yeah, the, the, there was a lot I liked, and uh, unfortunately there's kind of a glaring cancer cell at, in, at the center of it. Well, we'll talk about it. The basic story is, there's a character named Ben, played mm -hmm. by BJ. Mm -hmm. I think of Maria Bamford doing the voice of the baby Jesus. Baby Jesus. Like, she leaves, she leaves voicemails as the baby Jesus, and she says, mother. hey, it's BJ. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so... Um, Ben is this like 40 something guy living in New York. He's a writer for the New Yorker. He's a douchebag. Like he's a woman. He has no respect for women. He is sort of that version of a progressive liberal who thinks his way of big city living is like the antidote for all of America. He also feels like he, we see him meeting with his boss played by Issa Rae, like at a party trying to pitch her like a story for a podcast series because mm -hmm. he feels like, I don't know, like he needs to bequeath something to the nation. But one night he's in bed with a woman who he's hooking up with when his phone rings and he's told, your girlfriend died. And Ben is confused because he doesn't have a girlfriend. We find out it's a woman named Abby. She hooked up with Ben a few times. She clearly was very much into him. Meanwhile, he forgot she even existed somehow, which we need to talk about, he's convinced to fly his ass to rural Texas mm -hmm. to attend her funeral. After the funeral, he's riding with Abby's brother, Ty, who's played by... Boyd Holbrook. Who I really liked. Mm -hmm. And Ty convinces Ben they need to, like, avenge his sister's death. Because, because she was murdered. Because he believes she was murdered. But she overdosed on um, opiates, but... He thinks that there's foul play. Ty convinces Ben by basically saying, this would make a great story. But Ty doesn't realize he's saying it like, oh, you could make a podcast out of it. He's just saying like, it, like it's a great story. Ben immediately calls his boss, Issa Rae, explains to her what's going on. And it's important to know that part of the selling point of like Ben's story and what his intentions are is that he felt he feels like I'm in rural Texas. These basic hillbilly type people, they're all like a colorful cast of characters who are delusional. And we can get into, I think, the message of the movie. But that's how he sells the story. Mm -hmm. So the bulk of the movie is Ben interviewing Abby's family and other people within the community of this small rural town trying to get to the bottom of what's going on, which he believes really is nothing, that she really just OD'd. But everything culminates with Ben is having dinner with Abby's family after he's submitted all of his work. He, his car gets blown up, which we can get into, but he... You know, it, as the audience, we're supposed to think it's related to, like, him trying to go undercover to find out who killed and, her. And Eloise, his boss, says, like, you got enough. Come on back. Yeah, the, the podcast is perfect. I've already edited it. Like, you're done. You, for, for safety reasons, come back. Mm -hmm. So he's having dinner with the family, and they accidentally let it slip that, in fact, this girl who died, she was addicted to drugs. So her death is not an act. Like, I mean, it's expected. There's no foul play. So he gets really upset. He says some really awful things to these people. But then for some reason decides to still still spend one more night with them because he has nowhere else to go, I guess. And while he's there, throughout the film... Well, okay, so he, the rest of the family goes to this party, which is where the, the same type of party that Abby ended up overdosing at. And he, uh, on that night, is able to get into her cell phone. That's what I was going to say. Okay. Throughout the movie, we see him trying to get into her cell phone, okay. but it's locked. And then he finally cracks the code, which we can talk about gets into her phone and realizes that there was something weird about that night. The thing that was weird is Ashton Kutcher plays a record producer who has this like studio, like this really fancy music studio in this rural Texas town. So of course that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense because that's just a front. He's really a drug dealer. Mm -hmm. 
and where this party occurs that you mentioned is sort of in at an intersection of four different jurisdictions which we can talk about but because of the the sort of uh, ambiguity of whose jur jurisdiction they're in crimes that occur there don't really ever get followed up on so abby died because she was a drug addict but ashton kutcher's character is the one who sort of had her body moved to this area where no one's really going to investigate. There's because, no cell phone reception and it's just uh, oil derricks are there and that's about so it. So then no one's going to be sniffing around his little drug dealing situation. But Ben decides to show up and the gag is because when Ben kills Ashton Kutcher, he just shoots him in the head. Like that's how he's going to avenge Abby's death. The end. But based on that conversation, he decides to retract all of the hours of his podcast that that's about to premiere uh, on Issa Rae's network. And that's the end. He's a, on a subway in New York. Where to begin? Uh, should I just start going through my notes? The opening of the film is Ben with John Mayer. Mm -hmm. And they're at like a, a, a party, like a networking type party. And they're just talking, exemplifying how they're douchebags. Because they're talking about women like something that you just conquer. And, you know, John Mayer is obviously very good at playing a douchebag. But I guess you alluded to this already. I think the biggest problem with the thing, the thing I didn't like about this movie, because I loved all of the other characters. Um, and I think the writing for many scenes is really good. But I think that character of Ben and the person playing him is so unappealing. First of all, there's nothing more unattractive to me than a homely ass man talking about women like they're all at his disposal. Mm -hmm. Girl, like as far as we know, you're just a writer for the New Yorker. You don't appear to be super rich. So I don't and you're not very attractive. So I don't know what all these women are like wanting you for. But just watching him play that type of character is really unappealing. And then his arc, I don't understand what... We don't know as the audience what was told to him that convinced him to fly to rural Texas. Yes, that, that part from the jump doesn't make sense. And it also, he, he's trying to have his cake and eat it too with this character, as in he, he has an arc. He, he redemption. It's, it's and, redemption yeah. and growth. But he's always a little dead behind the eyes. Yeah. He, and even the choice to kill, it, 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 it goes too far into the dark. It, it needed to, I think, stay skirt yes. on some levels of ambiguity because once he shoots Ashton Kutcher, it's like, well, this proves to me that you didn't really learn anything, that you really are stupid. But I think that Novak would have been better served to cast somebody else uh, in that role, especially because he's surrounding himself by, you know, also a bunch of really good looking people. Yeah, all the other men, specifically Ty, and then some other sort of like offshoot characters. Well, Ashton Kutcher. Oh, and Ashton Kutcher. But they're, they're like at the rodeo. That guy's really attractive. And um, yeah, next to Ty and Ashton Kutcher, it's like, but I think that's part. Of, I'm sure someone would argue that the casting of BJ Novak makes sense because he thinks he's better than these people when really the family we meet in Texas, they're super smart and funny and all the people we meet in this small town of Texas are actually quite different. The problem is the message is so heavy handed. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, the assumptions we make about small town people and being conservative and then look, they surprise us. But the surprise is too, is too obvious. Like yes. they're a little too not like intelligent, like one of the sisters of Abby Harris, yeah, it, it, like like BJ's character references um, a quote by Chekhov, and then it's clear that she's read all of Chekhov's plays, and she's like, "Well, actually, what you said is not correct. There's no gun violence to any blah blah blah." And we find out that BJ actually has never read Chekhov. That to me felt a little too convenient and unrealistic because in the same sort of window of time, he's asking them about that burger chain called Whataburger. Mm -hmm. And he's, it's like their first real interview. And he's like, what do you all love about Whataburger? And they can't explain it. Mm -hmm. But it's like, but you're so articulate about everything else, but you can't explain why you really like Whataburger. So I think that shows some weaknesses in the writing. But yeah, I... The, uh, again, I, I think the weaknesses are surrounding his character and the, this, this mannered portrayal that, that makes it seem like this is supposed to be kind of Coen Brothers territory but but it's not it's it's not smart enough at any point to really uh get that way but but it could have been if this character had been manufactured a bit differently because we should it's okay to be repelled by him but we should also see what is th that that uh je ne sais quoi about what what is it that is attractive or appealing to anybody about him and there's really nothing uh because the, the, the first scene i found is like oh it's going to be one of those films and we'd be highly annoyed and surprisingly it you know doesn't do that. 
BJ's character uses the phrase 100% a lot. And it's supposed to, you know, it's, it's meant to seem obnoxious. And then I realized I say that a lot. So now I feel like I don't ever want to say 100% again. <laughs> Keep it, keep it 100? Well, no, like whenever someone says yeah, something yeah. I agree with, I say 100%. Um, I learned two things in this movie. One, Liam Neeson is in Schindler's List. I can't believe you didn't know that. Well, I've never seen Schindler's List. You've never seen that? No. Well, because I I mean, it's going to be a hard watch. It, well, yeah. I don't like watching anything about the Holocaust or slavery because I already know what it's about. And it's just, it just, You're just going to ruin your day. It just your, ruins my day. It's going to ruin your day. Yeah. Um, okay. So I think the overall message of this... Oh, I'll get to the second thing I learned in a minute. The overall message of this story, which is what BJ explains, and when he and his boss Issa are talking, is basically about, like, America's need for vengeance. E like, so the popularity of all these true crime series and podcasts really revolves around people wanting vengeance for, vengeance for things that really, like, have no, um, like, there are no ulterior motives in a lot of these cases people just don't ac can't accept the reality of the situation so they come up with all this bullshit and then there's conversation about really small town people are actually quite smart they just don't have outlets to funnel that intelligence so it gets funneled into like conspiracy theories and and drug addiction and violence and, and yeah. thing, things of that nature so i thought that that made sense but it's a little heavy-handed it's too general well, so I find it offensive in a different way. Sure. <laughs> but but I do like underlying that the point of uh, all of this manufactured nothingness stretched to eternity, like all these Netflix docuseries, like Bad Vegan, for instance, where it's like, this is really nothing that we could have wrapped up in a half hour segment. Uh, but yeah, it's very on the nose. Like the title of his podcast is Dead White Girl. Yeah. Uh, a lot about this is funny. I Maybe my favorite character, well, I think my favorite, I don't know, the, the grandma, Abby's grandma. Yeah, she's funny. She, she has some really funny lines. Um, one is like, she, uh, Ben's phone is getting all these alerts and then Abby's little brother is reading them because he names all the women he hooks up with on his phone um, based on like how he met them. So they're all like vague details. So it's like vague details. And one of them was like hot girl Raya. And the granny says, and it's like a background voice. She goes, I thought Raya was exclusive. <laughs> Cause you know, Raya is that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then she also starts crying. She tells the tale of the Alamo. Mm -hmm. And then fucking Ben doesn't know that like we lost the battle at Alamo. So he's saying like, yeah, like that was a great battle. And granny gets really upset. Cause she's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I thought that was funny. The second thing I learned is the history of Six Flags. Mm -hmm. So, like the theme park, like the chain of amusement park Six Flags, which where we are, there's one called Magic Mountain. It originally referred to the flags of the six different nations that have governed Texas. Mm -hmm. So those are Spain, France, Mexico, the Republic of Texas, the United States, and the Confederate flag or mm -hmm. States of America. So one of the Six Flags is the Confederate flag. Mm -hmm. Which I'm sure if you go to Six Flags, the Six Flags they have flying are just probably colors. A blank spot. You know, whatever. That's the history of the park. I'm not saying they're canceled, but it was just interesting to learn that. Yes. Uh, the, interestingly, he brings up Truman Capote's In Cold Blood, uh, which of course, if that had if podcast had been around or docu series back then, that's what that would have been. Uh, but you know, interestingly, Truman Capote uh, screwed all of his social network. He screwed himself over because he started just basically plagiarizing what everybody was telling him, all these socialites, but in how that is the kind of unlikable uh, watermark that he wants to reach, and he's doing a good job of it. But that's the lesson he learns at the end. I don't know, I'm sure I'm, sure I'm skipping ahead in your notes, but what's frustrating is he, he just, on a whim, deletes all of this as a gesture, uh, which which you know, plays very kindly to the mother, played by J. Cameron Smith, who's an actress I really like, and I think she didn't have as much to do in this. But... Uh, I wanted a reaction from Issa Rae. Like, they put in, all of these people put in hours and hours of work, and he's just like, nope, it's going to be a story just for me. Uh, you can probably talk about this better, but I thought Ashton Kutcher has, he, he was really great on screen. I thought he, well, I think he's a really well-written character and has a lot of really interesting things to say. And Well, the first thing, so when we first meet him, it's in a, his recording studio. Mm -hmm. And there's a girl singing, and at first... She sounds like Rebecca Black singing Friday, which is actually referenced in this movie. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just terrible singing, right? Mm -hmm. And then Ashton's character stops her and then starts talking about the history. 
he his story starts somewhere that makes no sense like about the, the like the creation of the universe and god but then he talks about like sound and how sound is our legacy and it was like i was hypnotized by what he was saying and then you can see the girl receive what he says mm -hmm. and then she starts singing and it's amazing mm -hmm. like her voice is amazing but then the lyrics are funny because she's talking about getting off her shift at claire's mm -hmm. <laughs> right but but with emotion and, and but with emotion passion, yeah. and then he talks to you know ashton continues to talk to ben about like i know that you thought we were going to be some hillbillies with no no, nothing in our heads and that's okay because here you are and you've learned something i just thought every time ashton's character opened like you said very well written uh but uh, again and he has this really great little monologue about uh the collapse of uh culture or society where all these people are quoting oscar wilde but have never read an oscar wilde play or um showing pictures of a, a of another capote reference really uh Audrey Hepburn and Breakfast at Tiffany's, but nobody's actually familiar with the movie. And, and, and then how uh, Ben is really a product of that himself. Also, Ashton's like production company, they have commercials. And the tagline for their commercial is making dreams come true since 2018. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Um, there's a scene where, so as Ben is investigating Abby's death, he ends up at a rodeo show. Mm -hmm. And then once again, not knowing like the culture of Texans in the area he's in, they're asking about like, who's a supporter of the University of Texas? And then he jumps up and says, yeah. And everyone boos him because in that region, they do not, they're, they're like all about Texas tech. I don't know anything about this stuff. But anyway, the rodeo like MC calls out Ben to go into the, you know, in front of everyone. So it's like a, a U University of Texas fan against the Texas Tech fan. And there's a funny scene where the MC is asking Ben, what do you do mm -hmm. for work? And he says, I'm a writer. So of course at the rodeo, they're thinking like you ride an animal. So the MC is like, well, what kind of animal do you ride? You don't look like you'd ride anything. And then Ben realizes, oh, he's the man's mistaken. So he tries to explain to him what a writer is in a very condescending way. I He's thought like, that you was asshole. I know what a writer you is. asshole. I know what a writer is. Like, what? <laughs> why would you talk to me this way? But then he he does pull something out of his ass for defending this this school he knows nothing about. He's like, oh, I think Richard Linklater went there, and the MC's like, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I I think those moments where they call out the fact that he's just this pretentious liberal who really doesn't know what the hell he's talking about, and he's so self obsessed and self absorbed that he really doesn't see the like you already mentioned. He's part of the problem too. Mm -hmm. So I think those moments work really well. So a clue throughout the film that Abby, like, probably was a pill popper, is every character Ben asks about her drug use with, they all say the same thing. Abby wouldn't touch an Advil. Mm -hmm. And I, after the second time, I thought, that's weird that everyone keeps saying keeps that. Saying like, that, who yeah. says that? Well, it's because they've all been coached mm -hmm. to pretend like Abby wasn't addicted to drugs. I did like the scene where he is interviewing the four separate law enforcement entities. That's my next note. So the intersection of the four jurisdictions, it's the police, the sheriff, highway patrol, and border patrol. And that seems really funny because the officers for each jurisdiction are sort of like yelling at Ben, complaining about the other. And it just exemplified sort of the chaos and the bureaucracy of all this bullshit. Um, and why so much slips through the cracks? Basically. Another really good scene is Ben goes... So Ty is implicating Sancholo, this like Latino or Mexican uh, drug dealer, as being involved or responsible for Abby's death. So Ben digs up the courage to just approach this drug dealer who has all these thugs around him with guns, and then Sancholo agrees to talk to him. And then when they get into a private space alone... It's clear that Sancholo is not, like, a dangerous man. He's, like, a nerd. Mm -hmm. And he was friends with Abby. And he really loved her because when they were in, like, junior high together, he couldn't they, he couldn't get a hold of Harry Potter books because it wasn't a good look. So every night... I think he said his mother was Christian. Or his, yeah, some, for, for some reason he couldn't get Harry Potter books. So Abby would call him every night and read all the Harry Potter books to him. So he really, really lo loved Abby and also... His voice changes. He turns into like a, you know, like a little nerdy guy. And then he says, I didn't kill her. On the night she died, I wasn't even in Texas. He was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And he shows a picture proving he wasn't there at the party where she died. He was in Tulsa with his niece 
watching an Adele concert. <laughs> I thought that scene was really sweet. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, of course, we see the dead Abilene Shaws, played by Leo Tipton, who's an actress who used to be known as Anna Lee Tipton, who's kind of an indie it girl about a little over a decade ago and things like Whit Stillman's Damsels in Distress. So I was, I was like, oh, I haven't seen her in a while, and I, I didn't... I wasn't able to find out why she changed her name because she was in quite a few things. I think the little details that they used to sort of lead to, ex like, lead to an explanation like the she wouldn't touch an Advil... Or the fact that Ben can't get into her cell phone. We see him try like three times to unlock her phone. And finally he gets the code because Abby's little brother used to sleep in her bedroom. And that's now the guest room for Ben. So the little brother's been sleeping in the room with Ben. And on his final night there, the little brother says like, oh yeah, my sister always used to say like heart for heart. Mm -hmm. And she had a number code. With and it. she had a number code which was like 1435, which also corresponded to like the numbers at the Whataburger, mm -hmm. like when they give you a number so the server can bring your food. So then all of a sudden he sees 1435 on Abby's like dresser and he realizes that's her code. That seemed a little too convenient. But my final note is the climax to me was when his Prius explodes and then he has, he finds out he has to go back home and then the family inadvertently lets it slip that Abby had a drug addiction. I think that should have been the end of the film. Because all of his actions after that don't make any sense. And like you said, because first of all, the way Ben is established is like this corny, self-obsessed dude who's delusional about his position in the world. And he seems so scared to do anything. For him to just all of a sudden think, I'm going to go shoot this man in cold blood. And, <laughs> and, and think that, and obviously we're led to believe that Ty helped him drag him to the same uh, place where... Abby had been dropped off so all's well that ends well but that doesn't make sense because Abby was just a girl who OD'd and she's at a party so there's nothing to really worry this, about there's just this drug dealer record but Ashton Kutcher is like a notable person who with, clearly has been murdered so I don't rid know riddled with bullets yeah. yeah I don't know why Ben thinks that these police sheriff highway patrol border patrol wouldn't look into it further but whatever of course it gives it does give Kutcher one more I think really good scene uh, and he has this at this party he has kind of like a his office, which is like a tent. <laughs> it's like an opium den. Yeah, yeah, an opium den. Because some girl gets dragged out. The girl that we saw singing earlier because she's obviously really messed up. Uh, it, and I, I liked that vibe about it too, uh, out in this oasis. But then, uh, again, yeah, just him shooting him seems... that for The it, the denim walk could have been much more poetic in a darker way. Um, what else do you have? That's it. I, what would you give it? Two and a half. I'm teetering because I liked it so much, but I really didn't like B.J. Uh, Novak as Ben. It's good, but even even the family, who's very entertaining and endearing, all of them are also kind of caricatures. Like, Boyd Holbrook's very enjoyable in this, but he's also... You know, they, they do kind of paint them... It, it's, it's In stereotype, like, extreme opposites... It, these characters are painted in extreme opposites of the stereotypes we would place on them, so it's equally as problematic. And I found it a little offensive... In a way that wasn't like satirical, so like I felt like if we had cut down on the lead character and spent more time kind of picking apart the yes. characterizing the family, because you have these two very interesting sisters that are very different, played by Isabella Mar and Dove Cameron, uh, but, but really they have nowhere to go. With I'm giving characters. it a three out of five because I would watch it again. That's how much I liked all the other characters, um, sure. and especially like the like Ashton Kutcher and Ty. Mm -hmm. Anything else? No. Hit the thanks button, listen to our podcast. Bye.